good to see everybody and, and to be able to gather together and say hello and to visit. If you're watching us online, welcome this morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. It's good to worship together. Let's open up with a word of prayer and then we'll uh, spend some time giving praise to God. Father God, we're just in awe of your goodness and of your mercy and of your great, amazing grace that you've shown us. God, through the journeys that we walk, as each and every one of us can look back on our lives and just see the hand walking beside us, see your hand guiding us, see your hand protecting us, your faithfulness, even when we weren't, even when we got our eyes off of you, Father, you never left us, you never forsake us. So God, we give you honor, we give you glory and praise this morning. May the fruit of our lips give you praise as we worship you. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and let's declare that this is amazing grace. Yeah.
lives magnified. Were creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry, and from north to south and east to west, we hear Christ be magnified. reflect the glory of the Lord. May our tongues speak of his goodness and his love. May our 
hearts serve and give. Show grace and mercy. Be faithful and just and good. Until the day that you return, may our lives magnify you, Lord, as we worship. you, but it gives me goosebumps to sing at the top of my lungs, come Lord Jesus. Come Lord Jesus. It's why we're in this. It's the end goal, to spend eternity with our Father. 
to worship him face to face. No more tears. No more suffering. No more pain. And until that time, God, may our lives magnify you. That none should perish, but all come to know you. Amen. You can be seated. It's something we bring up all the time, but we just like to reemphasize how important it is our prayer request. If you have prayer needs, please let us know that. Uh, we have people, I think there's a team of about 60 people or so, that take these prayer requests and pray on those all throughout the week. Uh, we also have a team of people that come in on our Zoom meeting on Tuesday night at 6 o'clock, and we go through each and every one of those prayers. And uh, if you'd like to be part of that Zoom link and, and join us Tuesday night at 6 o'clock, that's an open invitation. If you'd like to get that email with all those prayers, just let us know one of two ways. You've got the Connect card that you have, you can fill out. Uh, also online, we have the digital Connect card that is at our website, questchurchonline.com, that you can fill that out as well. The other thing is we're going to encourage you to do is just stick around after the end of this service. Uh, we've been doing this for a while now, but our kids' youth pastor, Jessica Dolan, has a message, um, and that's a really good one. It lasts about 10 to 12 minutes, and that's for the kids, but it's also for kids at heart. So I'd encourage you to uh, stick around for that as well. And with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to our senior pastor, Bill Walker. Well, good morning. Good morning. It's great to see you here today, and it's great to see you if you're at home watching as well. Uh, we're so glad, again, you chose to carve out part of your morning to spend with us. I want to begin with a thank you today. I want to thank our Quest Media team who stood in the gap uh, during our, the time that we were doing only social media uh, and uh, individuals that really came every, just about every Friday night to put everything together with Jerry Daniels, uh, Jessica Dolan, Kurt Hostetler, Tim McCall, Russ Moody, and Jason Smith. I want to thank all of them. And then I want to thank our entire uh, media team as well. We tried to limit things here because we didn't want have any, we had wanted to have as few exposed to each other as we could, but those people really stood in the gap. With that, we want to expand our media team. We really don't have a choice. We have to because now we're doing more production. So we need volunteers. If you could do sound, computer, run these PowerPoints and get those. Uh, you don't have to put them together. You just have to put them on the computer. If you think you'd like to learn how to operate the camera or even be part of production, we need people. We are stretched very, very thin now because we have more positions available. So if that's something you think you might be wildly or even vaguely interested in, I'll let Kurt Scott know. Secondly, I want to talk about this. I kind of spoke about this just a little bit last week, and that's about the situation with, in Malawi. And uh, here's a picture of the Naz Nazarene Theological College of uh, Central uh, Africa, and that's located in Mal uh, Malawi. And uh, this is Jeff uh, Kunzelman, uh, pictured with, he, he goes by Joe, that's his Americanized name, uh, but his name is Chinyami Lilami, and he's the principal of the Nazarene Theological uh, College uh, there in, uh, in Africa. Uh, which is in Malawi, and uh, he just put out the plea. These are two of his children right here. Uh, the people in Malawi are, uh, it's very dire, um, and some of them are, are literally getting close to starvation. They're down to many of them, one meal a day, and sometimes that meal is only tea. And we have 487 Nazarene churches in Malawi. A lot of those are small house churches that might be 10 to 12 people, and they have bigger churches as well. Uh, the government has closed the college, so now these students that were fed in college had to go home, no jobs to go home to. Uh, many families can no longer afford the food. We've talked about that. A family of four, now listen to this, a family of four can be fed for $25 a month. Isn't that amazing? $25 a month, less than a dollar a day, uh, food cost or so, and that's very sub, sub, subsistence eating, right? It's very low, but that feeds them, keeps them healthy. And uh, Quest has responded so far with 5000 from, uh, uh, from our dollar a seat fund. And much more help is needed. 
And that dollar of seed fund is anytime anybody comes here, we donate a dollar even here or at home if you're watching. We donate, we donate a dollar every single week, which is usually well over $400 a week uh, that we donate to that. And we had some money built up, so we've sent that. Uh, somebody called me this week and said, I want to donate 1000 Great. Somebody else called me already and said, we want to donate 200 That's great. Prayerfully consider about donating to this cause. And all you have to do is uh, giving information is online. There's a, a spot that you could put Malawi on it or just write Malawi on the envelope or the check, and we'll make sure Malawi gets it. And we can ship it over, and we can get it there in about three to four days now uh, once it leaves uh, our district office. So uh, they need a lot of help, and they're going to need help for the future. And uh, here's our way to, to help out. You know, I've, we've been inconvenienced uh, a lot with, with what's going on here, and whether you believe in masks or what you believe in, it doesn't matter. We've all been inconvenienced by this COVID situation. And I hate wearing a mask. We, we've asked all the staff wear the mask, so we do that. I shouldn't say hate. I greatly dislike wearing a mask. I'll put it that way. And I put the mask on, and when I do it now, I just think about Malawi. And I'm thinking, here I am griping about wearing this stupid mask, and they're starving. And it, now when I put my mask on, I say a prayer for Malawi. And it kind of frames things for me. And I'm just like, Bill, quit griping or complaining. You know, if you have to do something, just do it, Bill, and just think about Malawi. So if you could help in any way, you know, I, I, it would be great if every family here at Quest donated at least $25. Uh, that would cover a month, but I know some people can, can give more. And we want to be a church that helps people not only in our community, but are in our world as well. So carefully, just pray about uh, your involvement there, and uh, let's see what we can do to help the people uh, there. Well, let's pray as we continue our, uh, our series here. Well, Heavenly Father, I do pray for Malawi, and I thank you for allowing us to find out about what's going on halfway around the world and, and just touch our hearts to see how we can help both as a church, as individuals. I pray now that you would be with us as we continue to look at, at what you uh, have for us today through your writing, through the, the book of James, and just continue to open our, our hearts uh, to what you would have us do, not only today, but as we leave this place as well. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Again, we're talking about James, and James, we, we said, was the brother of Jesus Christ. He was the half-brother, and uh, he wrote this book about uh, a Christian living to these Jewish people that weren't necessarily in Jerusalem at that time. James was, but they were scattered out throughout the Mideast, throughout the kingdom, and they simply weren't living the Christian life they were meant to live. So James is addressing that. And uh, today, we wanna, we're in chapter four. We wrap things up next week. There's five chapters, and that'll be our fifth week. And James says this, he says in 4.1, what is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? So he says, basically, you're fighting with each other, but the problem's not the other person. You're the problem. It's coming from your own hearts. Don't blame other people for your quarrels. It's coming from each individual's heart and soul. And then he says this to the people. This is strong language. He says, you adulterers, now, when you're having an adultery means you're having an improper relationship with somebody else, and the people weren't necessarily in that physical relationship with each other. Some of them certainly were, but what he's saying here is you're having an improper relationship because you haven't put God first. You're basically cheating on God because you're putting the cares of the world ahead of God. And then he says this, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Wow. So what does that mean, friend of the world? Well, about, about 10 years ago, I had the privilege and the opportunity to, to go to a prayer retreat down in Trappist, uh, Kentucky. That's the name of the town, and it, it's, it's named after the monks that live there. Trappist monks have a, a, an abbey there. It's called the Abbey of Gethsemane. And I think there's still about 40 monks that are left alive that help run the place. And you go there, and it's a silent prayer retreat where you really don't talk. And the, the abbey there, it's not a totally silent order, but the monks there don't talk to the people when you come visit. Uh, they're pretty quiet. I mean, if they have to give you instructions or anything like that, they'll talk to you. But they don't even talk to each other. And um, if they're working and they have to communicate, they do that. But they don't get up and say, hey, how was your evening last night? How was your evening good? Or tell jokes or anything like that. They only talk when they absolutely, absolutely have to. And they don't communicate with the outside world, including the visitors, unless they absolutely have to. 
And there's two reasons when they go out, they'll talk to outsiders. Number one, if they have to do business with the outside world or pay bills or anything like that, they do that. Or if they have a medical appointment. And they've literally, literally, they do this because they know the outside world can influence them in a negative way. And they're very devout and very true to how they believe the outside world can come into what they're doing and, if again, uh, cause them to maybe to, to become worldly or do things they shouldn't be doing. So is that just the solution? If we, we don't want to be friends with the world, let's all move down to uh, Gethsemane, the Abbey of Gethsemane. Let's go there and let's totally isolate ourselves. And again, I am not criticizing what they're doing, but is that what we should do? And what do we talk about when we talk about enemies of, of, of God, right? And friends with the world. What, what's that all about? Well, again, when, when he says this, he says, you adulterers, uh, don't you realize that you worship? Uh, when, that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? Friend of the world, enemy of God, basically. Well, again, I want to look at one of the words that he uses there, and he says the world. And, and we have to understand what James is talking about when he says the world. And again, the language they use doesn't transfer entirely perfectly to modern English. And so by the world, what James is saying when he uses that word, the world, he's saying it means worldliness. And I love what focus on the family defines worldliness is. It's the ungodly system of human life as it is lived in a separation from God. I love that's a great definition. It's ungodly life. It's you're living a life that's separated from the life that God has for you, basically. And for James, the world, would, uh, the world and friendship with the world includes both seeking the wrong things. So friendship with the world would be seeking, if you're out seeking drugs, improper relationships with people you shouldn't be in relationship with. If you seek to rob from other people, you seek to do those bad things. Okay, that's easy enough. That's friendship with the world. But for James, friendship with the world also includes and our wrong attitude toward other things. So there could be something in our life that's really good, right? But we could have the wrong attitude toward it. I'll give you two examples. Our children. Children are a good thing. Parents want to have children. Grandchildren are good things. But you know what? We can, we can have the wrong attitude toward our children and treat them terribly. Or I see some parents that almost worship their children. Children are a good thing, but sometimes we can have a wrong attitude toward our children. Money is another thing. Money is amoral, not immoral. Money is amoral. Money can be used for a lot of bad things, can it? But money can also be sent to Malawi to save people from starving, right? So it's a lot of uh, how we live in the world has to do with our attitude toward even really good things. And then James uh, goes on and he says this when he's talking. He talks about the friend of the world. So we talked about what world means. And now we have to understand what friend meant for James. And what friendship means or what friend meant for James is so different than what we mean when we say friend. So how does he use the word friend? Well, first of all, deeper meaning than we have today. Uh, and I looked up synonyms for for friend, and this, uh, this was the top seven or eight cinnamons for fr uh, friend, and here they are. Acquaintance, ally, associate, buddy, colleague, companion, partner. Those are, the those are the best we have, but none of those, none of those comes close to describing what James is talking about when he says friend. So deeper in, uh, meaning and a different meaning, but, but also as we're talking about, it means you have a really strong affection an attachment, a devotion, endearment, or familiarity. James is talking about friendship when you're so close that your lives are intertwined. Now, now all of us might have a, one or two friends like that, but that's the type of friendship that James is talking about. You're intertwined uh, with the world. Uh, it's someone who has your back, who you can trust and confide in. We all have those people in our lives that when the going gets tough, we can call them. If we have a problem, we know they have us covered, right? That's the kind of friendship the world, with the world that James is talking about when we're so uh, immersed in the world that we get so close to it. And for James, again, it's never a good thing when we're friends with the world in this way. It's a relationship that is dear and precious and valuable. 
In other words, it's more than just Facebook friends, right? And we say friends on Facebook, right? We say, how many Facebook friends do you have? I'm well over 20 Facebook friends now. I don't like to brag, I'm well over 20. No, I have a few more than that, but I don't have nearly as many as my daughter and, and Mary do. But uh, can you imagine, I've got some Facebook friends, I've got several I haven't seen since high school, okay? And they say, you want to be friends on Facebook? And I always say yes, if I know the person, because I want to get up to, you know, 30 friends someday. So I say yes for my Facebook friends, right? So if anybody wants to be Facebook friends with me, just look me up, I'll always say yes. But I don't look for people's friends, because I think that's kind of creepy for an old guy to be doing that. But I'm always glad to accept friends, you know? I'll do that, so feel free to do that. But suppose I call one of these friends from high school I haven't seen and many, many years now, and say, you know, it's about one in the morning, I can't sleep, and I think, okay, I find out their number, I give them a call, they answer the phone, hello, hey, hey, Larry, it's Bill Walker, remember, we went to high school, yeah, I, I remember you, yeah, yeah, we're friends on Facebook, hey, I can't sleep tonight, I was just wondering if we could talk about some things, it'd be weird, wouldn't it, right, it's just like, ooh, you know, <laughs> unfriend Bill Walker, and, you know, he's crazy, right? So when we say friends, and we are, we're Facebook friends, but for James, it was totally different. And I do have two or three people in my life, actually a couple more of that, where I could get up in the middle of the night and say, hey, I'm struggling. Can I at least talk to you? And they say, absolutely, Bill. A absolutely. And we all have friends like that. That's the kind of friendship he's talking about. And when we look at the world that way, when we're so intertwined with the world, when we look to the world, to give us the affirmation and the direction that we need in life, that's what James is talking about. He says, don't do it. Don't look to the world. Look to God. Now, it's important that when we say friendship with the world, what we understand what it doesn't mean. Here's what friendship with the world does not mean. First of all, it doesn't mean you dislike people. I'm done with people. They're all bad. They're all evil. I'm just going to get away from them. No, 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 that's wrong. In fact, John 3, 16, here's one of the key foundation of verses for Christians. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. God loves the world. Now, the world there, he's not talking about the world that James is talking about. He's talking about the people in the world. God loves people. We need to love people. Secondly, when we talk about friendship with the world, it doesn't mean you discount others and their feelings. Jesus never did that. He disagreed with the religious uh, know-it-alls, and he challenged them, but he didn't discount the, the feelings and the emotions of other people because he loved them. And even though they didn't accept him and always follow him, we can just hear Jesus pouring out his heart. This is shortly before he was crucified. And he's looking at his followers, and here's what he says, just, just a few days again before he would face his crucifixion. Jesus says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers. How often I have wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. Wow, you matter to me. You don't agree with me. You're not following me. Oh, it breaks my heart, but you matter to me. Your feelings matter to me. I don't agree with you, but guess what? I care about you. Thirdly, when we're talking about friendship with the world, it does not mean that you don't care or help others in need. We need to help people that are in need. We need to help good people in need, and we need to help bad people in need because God loves people. In James, at the end of this chapter, there are 17 verses in this chapter. Here's the last thing he says. Listen to this. This is how he ends this chapter. Remember, it is a sin to know what you do and then not to do it. He's saying, you don't want to be friends with the world, but guess what? You have to care about the world, right? You don't have to be immersed and immersed in the world, but you have to care about other people. And if you see a need, you have to do it because people matter to Jesus and people should matter to us as well. So what being friends with the world, what does it mean? It means worldliness over a godliness when we're friends with the world. It means seeking what the world has to offer over what God has to offer. Friends with the world means seeking the physical, the temporary gratification of things over the eternal things of God. God works through crockpots, not microwaves, oftentimes. He works slowly through things, and we're at a 
we're an instant gratification world, aren't we? Friends with the world also means I'm enemies with God. It always means enemies with God. We become friends with the world when we do these things. And the first one is when we choose money over mission. We become friends with the world when we choose popularity over pleasing God. We become friends with the world when we choose self-interest over sacrifice and service. You know, we ask people to church to do some things sometimes, and sometimes they say yes, and sometimes no, and you need to pray about it and see if you're led. But so many times we don't want serving God, both inside the church and outside the church, we don't want it to be an inconvenience. And we worry about our own self-interest rather than our sacrifice and service. And we don't want to go to on the other side and become legalistic, right? And become works righteousness, I have to do it all. That, that never ends. But oftentimes we choose self-interest over sacrifice and service. We become friends with the world when we choose dying to get ahead over dying to self. We become friends with the world when we choose performance over peace. We become friends with the world when we choose the permissible over the perfect. You know, you can do a lot of things in life. There's a lot of things you can do that are, le- that are legal that aren't good for you. You know, you can do le- illegal things if you don't get caught, right? But the good news is, is this. We're imperfect people. But God has a perfect plan for you. And that plan includes where you are right now, where you are as a student right now, where you are as a son or a daughter right now, where you are as a parent right now, uh, where you are as a friend right now, where you are as a member of the church right now, where you are as your job right now. God has perfect plans for imperfect people. I'm living proof of that, right? That's the God that we serve. We become friends with the world when we choose acceptance over accountability. We we care so much about being accepted that we don't don't spend time with the people that should hold us accountable, accountable to things. And we become friends with the world when we choose casual friendship over real fellowship. Man, we have a couple small groups that are going, and some of them have met for years, and they are in real fellowship. And sometimes that takes a while to develop This fall, we want to start moving toward more and more groups that meet long-term, that start out by meeting for a year and a year and a half, and hopefully those groups continue because it takes a while to have real fellowship. I mean, you can have fellowship the first time you meet, but but the better you get to know people and the closer you get and the more comfortable you feel about each other and the safer you feel, that's when people begin to open up. You know, I was thinking about this whole sermon series and we talk about enemies with God. Nobody that I've ever met, there's a few people out there, nobody ever says, I want to become enemies with God. It just doesn't happen. I mean, if you think about it, there might be some people that worship Satan that want to be enemies with God, but very, very few people that I've ever ever talked to, I thought, I've never heard that. that. That includes people inside the church and inside this church, other churches. It includes other people as well people just don't ever say they want to become an enemy with God. But then James writes about it. Why? It's because it happens. And here's how it happens. It happens become, because, again, we become so intertwined and immersed in the world that we live in. That's how it happens. It, 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 and it happens gradually, a little at a time, and before we know it, we're going places and doing things that that God doesn't want us to do. Again, they might not even be terrible things, but they're not God's God things, and they're, they're not the things that God wants us to do long term. And you can still go out and have time. You can have hobbies. You can go on vacation. Absolutely. We're not saying take all the fun out of life, but we need to look for God in things and see what he would have us do. And if we don't do that, slowly, gradually, we become friends with the world. And friends with the world always means enemies with God. 2 Corinthians 6.14, Paul, here's what he says. He writes to the church at Corinth, and he says this, don't team up with those who are unbelievers. 
in some of your translations in 614, it says, don't be unevenly yoked. Don't be attached with those who are unbelievers. Can you have friends that are non-Christians? Absolutely. You should. You need to, right? But you don't want to be attached in this way that you're relying upon them for things that only God and other Christians can give you. And John, listen to this. Jesus gets this. And, and, and you, you see like the foundations of his ministry. He got everything he needed from God. He didn't look for other people to get affirmation or to, to get direction in life. And we hear the words about Jesus here. But Jesus didn't trust them, other people, because he knew about all people. He didn't trust people. And you're like, was he a paranoid person going, I don't trust you, I don't trust you, I'm not going to... No. He trusted in God. He did what God wanted him to do. But he didn't trust people for his affirmation. He didn't trust people for his direction. He trusted in God. So he wasn't bitter about other people. He knew they weren't perfect, and God was. So he looked for God. So Jesus didn't trust them because he knew all about people. No one needed to tell him about human nature, for he knew what was each person's heart in perfection. I'm going to rely upon God. I'm going to minister to these people. They're imperfect. I'm not going to become embittered toward them. I'm going to do what I can do, but I'm going to always trust in God. That was the foundation of his ministry. But later on, well into his ministry, and this is in John later, so about 13 verses later, Jesus says this. He says, you are my friends if you do what I had commanded. Now, when he says that, he's not saying, if I get to boss you around, then you're my friend. What he's saying there, if you do what I command, I'm only commanding you to do what God has told me to do. So if you follow what I tell you to do, we're both following God together. So he says now, he's beyond not trusting. He says, hey, you can be my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves. Some of your translations say servants. I no longer call you servants because a master doesn't confide in his slaves or servants. Now you are my true friends. Why? Because Jesus had ministered to them, poured out into their lives, and now he's to the point where he can confide in them. He can talk to them, even though, even though all of his disciples either deserted him or betrayed him when he was crucified. That, that was okay with Jesus. He had, you know, friends sometimes let us down, but he had gotten to the point with them where he could trust them as much as he was going to. And he said, now you're my friends. You're imperfect. He realized that. But now, at least I can call some of you my true friends because I'm entwined in your life and you're entwined in mine. So how to become friends with God? Closing, we'll talk about three things. First thing, work to cultivate your friendship with him. You have to work at it. You have to spend time with him. You have to spend time in prayer. You have to read his word. You have to be willing to invest in this friendship. You know, how can you have a friend without spending time with them? And some of you have friends from years ago that you can pick up right where you were. Maybe you only see them once or twice a year. But the truth of the matter was years ago, I guarantee if you have a friend like that, at one time you did spend a lot of time with them. So maybe at one time you spent a lot of time with God and you're not, he's still there for you. Secondly, how do you become friends with God? Become friends with his friends. You want to become friends with God, become friends with his friends. There are a lot of Christians out there that, again, it's okay to have people, uh, your friendship with people that don't, aren't Christians, don't believe in God. That, that's, that's good. But we have to be friends with God's friends as well. See, that's why small groups are so important. Uh, that's why reading the Bible is so important. The Bible is full of stories about people who are friends with God. Got some enemies in there too. But it's chock, chock full of stories about people that were friends with God. All of them were imperfect, but they were God's friends. We read the Bible, we read about his friends and what they did and how they acted and how they felt and what they did when they make mistake, when made mistakes. So become friends with, pe with God's friends. That's people in the Bible and people in our, here on earth. That's why Christian fellowship is so important. And then third and final today, unfriend the person and thing in your life that's interfering with God's friendship with you. Now, before we go on, let me say this. 
This does not mean that you go into work or you go out to the, the golf league or somebody and you go, hey, listen, you know, we've been good friends for seven or eight years. My pastor said I can't be friends with you anymore. <laughs> Don't do that. Do, do not do that. That's not what we're talking about. But if there's a person or thing in your life, maybe you're relying on that person for your direction and your affirmation instead of God. And so maybe you need to change your attitude toward their friends. And there are some friends that might be in your life that you really do need to sever that friendship with. That might be possible if they're leading you down wrong uh, roads all the time. That could be possible. But maybe there's a thing in your life. You know, I hear about stories about people that are on their phone for five hours a day. It's probably not a good thing. And I'm not saying get rid of your phones. Maybe you need to cancel some of the time that you're on your, your phone. Uh, maybe you're in a relationship with people that don't bring out the best in you and you need to change your attitude uh, toward the relationship. Whatever it is, you need to work on unfriending that particular thing or maybe your attitude toward that thing. Again, you don't ditch that person maybe necessarily, but maybe change your attitude toward that thing in your life that's interfering with your friendship with God. So that's what I want you to do this week. I want you to look at your life. And really, maybe there's something in your life that's interfering with God's friendship with you. Could be a person, could be a thing, could be an attitude, could be a sin. I don't know what it is. But whatever it is, you need to hit the unfriend button and say, no, I'm going to change my attitude. Uh, I'm going to change my feelings about this person. I'm going to do things differently. I'm going to quit doing this in my life because you know what? This is making me friends with the world, but it's costing my friendship with God. We have one of two choices, friendship with the world or friendship with God. We have to choose that daily. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm the first to admit that sometimes I get caught up into things of this world. Maybe even sometimes they're good things and I have the wrong attitude toward them and I give them a place in my heart they shouldn't have. Father, I would just pray that you would just speak to each one of us here today. And if there's just, just reveal to each one of us that one thing, that we just need to unfriend, that's keeping us from becoming the person you would have us be. Uh, just speak to us, Father. Maybe reveal to that to us right now or as we leave this space and to show us what thing that we need to turn our back on, what thing we need to walk away from, what thing we need to get rid of that's interfering with our friendship with you. We say this and we pray this in your name, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here today. If you're watching at home, we urge you to just to stick around and listen to Pastor Jessica's message. Go in peace and go in safety. Thanks for being here. joining me again this week. Let's jump on into our activity today. It's time to play accept it or reject it. I'm going to read a statement and if you accept the statement as true, then you're going to give a thumbs up. But if you reject the statement as false, then you're going to give a thumbs down. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. A cat spent four years serving as the ceremonial mayor in the town of Minnesota. Do you accept this as true or do you reject it as false? Well, the answer is reject. It was actually a dog. Okay, a man in Germany once grew a pumpkin that weighed more than 2,500 pounds. Do you accept it as true or do you reject it as false? Except that is a true statement. All right, a bat eats three million insects each night. Accept or reject? The answer is reject. A bat actually only eats 3,000 insects, not three million. Ready for the next one? Eating too many carrots can turn your skin orange. Accept or reject? The answer is accept. That one is true. Okay, last one. Your body's largest organ is your skin. Do you accept that as true or do you reject it as false? Well, the answer is accept. 
That one is true. You know, when Jesus came to earth, he taught people the truth about God and his kingdom. Did everyone accept Jesus' words as true? No. Today we're going to hear about a time when Jesus was rejected in his hometown. But first, do you remember our big picture question? Here it is. What makes people so special? People are special because we are made in God's image as male and female to know him. And you know, Psalm 103 says that the Lord made us and we are his. Our big picture question and answer actually reminds me of each of you. Each of you are special to God and you were created in his image. Let's check out some of our special friends in the Quest Kids Spotlight. Roll the video! job everyone if you would like to be featured in the quest kids spotlight send me a video or a picture of you interacting with the lesson last week we learned that jesus traveled around teaching amazing things about god and people came to jesus and you know what he did he healed them so this week we're going to learn about what happened when jesus went back to where he grew up to teach people about himself Jesus went to the town of Nazareth, where he had lived when he was a boy. Now, Jesus was grown. He traveled all around teaching people about God. On the Sabbath day, Jesus went to the synagogue in Nazareth. The synagogue was a special building where Jews met together to pray, worship, and learn about the scriptures. Jesus stood up to read scripture. He unrolled the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and read, The Spirit of the Lord is on me. He has chosen me to tell good news to the poor. He has sent me to tell the captives that they are free, to tell the blind that they can see, to free people who have been treated badly, and to announce that the Lord's favor is on us. Then Jesus rolled up the scroll. He gave it to the attendant and sat down. Everyone in the synagogue stared at Jesus. Jesus said, today, as you listen to me reading these words, they came true. The people said good things about Jesus and they were amazed at him. But some of the people in Nazareth had known Jesus from his youth. Isn't this Joseph's son? They asked. Jesus said, no prophet is accepted in his own town. Jesus told the people about times when God used prophets to help people who were not Jews. He reminded them of Elijah and Elisha. When there was a terrible famine in Israel and no rain fell there for three and a half years, plenty of widows in the country needed help. But the prophet Elijah did not help the widows in Israel. Instead, God sent Elijah to help a widow in another land. And when Elisha was a prophet, many people in Israel had leprosy. They wanted to be healed, but Elisha did not heal them. Instead, he healed a man named Naaman. Naaman was from Syria, a country that hated God's people. The people in the synagogue were angry. They forced Jesus out of town. They wanted to throw him off a cliff, but Jesus walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Hundreds of years before Jesus was born, the prophet Isaiah wrote about God's plan to send a Messiah. The Messiah would bring good news and redeem people who were broken and hurting. Jesus read Isaiah's words and announced that he is the promised Messiah. Jesus taught that he's the Messiah. And at first, the people seemed pretty impressed and maybe a little bit confused. But when Jesus reminded them how Elijah and Elisha helped people from outside of Israel, the people in the synagogue became angry. And to understand why, we need to understand what Jesus was teaching them. God's plan all along was to use the nation of Israel, and God promised to bless them and to bless the world. 
But over time, many of the Jewish people began to see God's blessings as something that was only for them. And they didn't want any other nations to be blessed. Jesus was reminding them that God's love doesn't stop with the Jewish people, but it extends out to all people because all people are special to God. Jesus was teaching them that his role in God's plan was not to make Israel powerful again, but to bring salvation to all nations, to everyone who believes in him. This was God's plan all along. And you know, when I think about God's plan, I think of our key passage. Let's read our key passage together. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John 3, 16. What a powerful verse that is. Well, friends, that's all the time that we have for today. I want you to keep working on learning the key passage, and I hope that you have a blessed week and you're able to show the love of Jesus to someone. See you next week. Bye. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus.